1 John chapter 4. All right. Well, we've been making our way, and we started last week in chapter 4. And if you remember last week, um, John began this first part of the chapter. He was warning us about, <clears throat> us about false teachers. And so we're going to see John kind of changing gears a bit. So let's, let's pray real quick. Lord, as we open up your word, we pray that you would just bless this time, that you would come and minister to our hearts, Lord, that <clears throat> these words would come alive. Lord, that they would, they would speak to each and every one of us this morning, and so we thank you for that in Jesus' name, amen. So again, John, he, he changes gears a bit here, and he tells us that even, even though we, we are to test the spirits, as he says, as we are to, as he warns us about false teachers, he, he tells us too that, you know, we, we, can't, we can't get cynical. And although we're able to identify heresy and we're to identify false teachers, we also, we have to understand that we also have to have love, you know? And we, we have to love sinners, right? We have to love sinners. And so, because that's us, right? We're sinners, and so we, we need to be careful that we don't become, you know, sin sniffers, right? <laughs> and, and so, you know, let, I, I, I just say this, God hates sin. We know that, right? God hates sin. You know, God hates our lies. God, you know, because they're sin. When we lie, it's sin. You know, God, he, he doesn't like when we gossip because it's sin. God, he, he can't stand when we cheat on things, right? God hates our sinful thoughts. He, he does. Sin is sin. God hates sin. Um, but God loves it when we confess. God loves it when we repent. And, and, and because when that allows him to cleanse our hearts, that allows him to make us right with him. <clears throat> and so when we recognize that sin, it frees us, and, and we ultimately come, become closer to the Lord when we do that. You know, as too, though, as a pastor, I, I realize it, and I believe it, it is my job to warn people when I see them sinning. You know, uh, we're all sinners, right? But, but if we see a brother you know, that, and it, it, I think that's important sometimes to biblically confront people, and in love, right? And just share honestly with them. And, and again, though, we have to be careful that we don't again, become sin sniffers, right? The sin police. And, and what do I mean by that? You know, we have, listen, we essentially, we, we don't want to be searching and seeking, uh, you know, hiding behind the bush, waiting for someone to sin. I mean, we don't want that, Right? And, and, and what we have to realize is that God, he's working on people's hearts. And, and, you know, aren't you thankful that he worked on your heart and he kind of gave you grace and mercy and, and showed you, gave, you know, and so I, I guess I say all that because we have to allow the Lord to convict, right? We have to allow the Lord to, to his Holy Spirit to, to bring us closer to him and to convict us of our sins. And so... We, as believers, we need to point people to his grace. And because, guys, we have been shown so much grace, haven't we? And so we have to show grace to others, right? And we, you know, we err on the side of grace, right? We err on the side of grace. So <clears throat> in this portion of Scripture, as we, as we come to 1 John, and I'm going to begin in verse 7 in a moment here, but, you know, 
I, I love this portion of Scripture, and it's my favorite portion of Scripture to read at a wedding. As most weddings, I, I use this next Scripture that we're going to read in a, in a moment um, because it's all about love. Love is the context. And it, the only way we can truly know love is to know God, right? And so once again, we find John here. He's bringing us to this, this, this subject uh, of Christian love. And, and if you've noticed in 1 John, there's this repetition, isn't there? There's a repetition, and this is one of the major themes of verse John is, this, is love. And we might be thinking, well, has John run out of things to say? <laughs> you know, oh, hey, I don't know what else to say, so let me talk about love again, you know? But, but no, it's, it, it, the Holy Spirit understands our need to be reminded. <laughs> he understands that we need to be reminded constantly, don't we? And so he, John returns to this topic of love, and he, he's really expanding uh, his perspective and giving us this, this call to love and this emphasis to love. Again, we've seen this in our study, First John, that love is really the defining mark of a child of God, love. <clears throat> they will know we are Christians by our love, right? And so look at what it says in verse 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So listen, the Spirit of God is the Spirit of love, and this new nature that, that God gives us in our hearts, the Lord gives us it, 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 the offspring of that, the thing that comes out of our heart is love. And all through this section, we're going to see John, he uses this word love, and it's the word agape. Agape love, right? There's different, in the Greek, there's different words for love, but this is the agape love that it's, that it's talking about here. It's, you could translate it, you could say this is God's unconditional, self-sacrificing love. There's different words for love. It's not a sentimental love. You know, it's not a romantic love. It's not a social love. It's this, we would say it's a supernatural love. It's a God type of love. Agape love, and, and the love by which the Holy Spirit, he can put in our hearts, and only by the Spirit of God can, it make, can he make it real to us. And so God's Spirit enables us to love others, right? And so we see four times in just this verse, the, the word love is found, the word agape is found. And in these five, in just five verses we're going to be looking at today, that in the, I think the first five are the, the word love is found 14 times, <laughs> right? <clears throat> we might even define love, this love, agape love. I, I think that it's, <clears throat> it's choosing to assign great value to another person, love. Well, like the text continues in verse 8, and he says, He who does not love does not know God, <clears throat> for God is love. He who does not love this agape love or agapo <laughs> love does not know God. Does not know. It's the, to know is, is the word gnosko in, in the Greek, gnosko, or does, to, to know, to, to learn to know. You could translate that, to come to know, to get to know, this knowledge, to have this perspective. This, you could translate that, this knowledge-based experience, to know. You know this, right? We've all already learned that this is God's nature, right? That he is righteous, and, and the one who claims to, to know God, to have God in his life, ought to be displaying this, this righteousness. You know, as Christians, we, we, we know God. You know, if we know God, then we're going to experience this love. And so John, he tells us this is the very nature of God, is this love. And, and a person who claims to have God in their life is going to display this, these types of characteristics, this God type of love. You know, if we, if we, if we say we know God, then we're going to, we're going to experience, we're going to sh be showing this type of love in our lives. Now, we have to be, I think, somewhat a little careful here because John's not saying love is God. Because, you know, there's some people who want to turn this around and they, they want to say any kind of love is of God. Any kind of love. 
And so they try to justify their immorality and say, well, you know, they claim love is therefore it's okay because God is love. You know, and we see this in our society a lot. You know, we see many people, and maybe you've seen the signs, and, 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 it, and, and it, 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 it's a sign that says love is love. <laughs> right? And when you see that sign, you, you think, well, what do they mean by that? Right? And their definition, it doesn't matter who or what or, or what you love as long as you love. Right? If you love a robot or if you love an animal or a kid or a rock, it doesn't matter as long as, the, as there's love there. It's, 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 it's love is love. It's, it, you know, that's their thing. And it doesn't matter the type of relationship it is. You know, in our society, it's gay, straight, bi, couple, throuple, anything. Love is love, you know. That's, that's what they're saying, you know. And so their definition of love is not God's definition. Is, is what we have to come, come to. And they've made their own definition. And so their, their love, their definition of love is twisted. It's demented. It's demonic. I read this quote, and, and, and I, I believe it's kind of accurate, but it said, um, love does not define God, but God defines love. Right? And our, our whole society wants to redefine love. They want to redefine it. Think about this here. Here's kind of the love test. John is not saying that loving others makes you born again. He's, no, he's kind of giving this new test. He's, John is giving us this test to, as to who a real Christian is, right? We, we, we've already seen that, you know, a person who, who's born of God also practices righteousness and, and, and lives this lifestyle, and, 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 and it's not a lifestyle that practices sin, but but, but there's something different that starts coming out of our life because God is righteous. And if you really know him, if you really know him, right, then, then he'll be at work to help you become more righteous, become more loving. He's going to be at work in your life. We've already seen this, member in John chapter 2, verse 20, 1 John chapter 2, verse 29. You know that he is righteous... You know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Now, here's the test about love, loving one another. It's not a matter of, you know, your personality. It's not a matter of what kind of family you grew up in. It's, 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 it's something that's, that's tied to whether or not you know God. That's what it's tied to. Do you, do you know God? Then, then, then there's going to be some love there. I mean, Jesus himself, he said, he said something similar, and he said, you're going to know people by their fruits. You're going to know them by their fruits. In Matthew chapter 7, as a matter of fact, listen to what Jesus said. He said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. You're going to, you know, you might even say, you're, if they show love, it, you can kind of tell it's fake. It's false love. It's not real. Because it, it it, he again goes and says, a tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a bad tree can bear good fruit. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. You will know them. And so John says, here's the test for us, okay? Does your life show Love or fruit, as Jesus said. Does your life show this? You know, one of the things I think that trips people up concerning love is just understanding what actually love looks like. Because we put boundaries on love, don't we? But not God, not the God kind of love. <laughs> and we think love. You know, when we think the word love, I think a lot of people think of mushy romantic stuff, right? Or a love story, right? But, but um, we, we kind of 
make the mistake that we limit love to, to that kind of happy, warm feeling in your heart. I know that <clears throat> when I proposed to Lisa, I, um, we were up at, at Snow Going Pass. It was kind of snowing, and, and I, had, I had this ring and an ornament because it was December, right? And... Um, <clears throat> It was snowing, and, and I, I took it out, <laughs> and, and I showed it to her, and she's like, oh, an ornament, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I was like, no, you got to open it up, you know, and there it is. <laughs> but, but that's not what we're talking about, <laughs> that type of love, right? It's like we're talking about a choice we make when it comes to love. It's not, it's not even if we don't feel like it. You see, we don't always feel like loving someone. Aren't you thankful that God loves us, even no matter what? I mean, I think Paul, he gave a phenomenal definition of love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We call it the love chapter. And when you look at that passage, you will see that there's no emotional thrill. When it, when it, if you really think about love... It, and in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, listen to this, okay? Love is patient. We don't really like being patient, do we? <laughs> love is kind. We don't always like being kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. And this is kind of getting kind of hard, isn't it? <laughs> it's not rude. It, it does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never gives up. Love never loses faith. It's always hopeful, endures through every circumstance. See, when you choose agape love, it's a little different, isn't it? It's that when you start doing these kinds of things that Paul describes here, you know, you realize love is a little different to find in the Bible here. I mean, think about Jesus. The love, think about the, the love that Jesus had. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, remember what happened? He gave a commandment to his disciples. And here's what he said in John chapter 13. He says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this, you'll know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Isn't that awesome? But right before that, do you know what actually happened? Before he gave this commandment, he had done something very, very strange. He, he, He had done something that only servants do. Remember what he did? He washed the disciples' feet. That was, that, that was something for the lowest of the lowest servant. That's what he did. And then, and then he said, now you guys do this. This is how you love. That's the Jesus kind of love that, that we're, is, we're defining right here, this humility and, and this, this service to others. And, and um, you know, we complicate love, don't we? I think that when you know we start thinking if we love someone we will let them do whatever they want in their life you know we'll just you know that's it's like but 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 God he sets limits on love you know on behavior it's at least because he doesn't let a person just do whatever they want that wouldn't be loving would it but he encourages us to do the right thing you see you know, the author of Hebrews writes, that they were, you know, the Hebrews, they were going through certainly difficult times, and, and they almost felt like God wasn't loving them, like he's given them a spanking, or he was, you know, he was, it says he was chastising them. And, and in Hebrews chapter 12, 
It tells us that, you have, have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons? My sons, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. The Lord loves, whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. So love looks sometimes a little different, doesn't it? Being punished is never fun. <laughs> never, right? As a parent, there's no delight in, in disciplining children. And sometimes the Lord has to knock some sense into us, doesn't he? <laughs> and he's always wanting to teach us to trust him, to, to you know, and, and I'm thankful that he, that he doesn't just let us get away with stuff. I remember this one time I had, I had taken a, a second job. And so I was doing, I had my job, and then I had the church, and then I had another job. So it was kind of like a third job in some ways. And I was working for this little publication company, and it was really stressful for me. And, and, and I remember just crying out to the Lord and, 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 and bawling my eyes out or something like that. And I remember him speaking to my heart. I remember him saying to me, I never told you to take that job. <laughs> and, and, I, and I just, I, I remember just this kind of discipline kind of set, because then I had to kind of walk backwards and kind of, you know, figure out, okay, now what do I, I made myself into a mess, and now I had to figure this thing out, and, and I was stressed for no reason, you know? And, and it's those times that we realize, you know, the Lord, I, you love me. You're going to take care of me, you know? And sometimes that love is a chastening, right? Is a discipline. And that, that person who, who's loved, it's, it's there, sometimes, you know, the, the love sets these limits on this behavior. And sometimes love encourages the other person to, to say no to the wrong things. You know, look at verse 9. It continues, it says, in this love... Of God was manifest towards us that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. God's love is so amazing. It's so amazing that he sent Jesus to this world so that we could have life. And we, because we have a problem, we have sin. And, And our sin results in death. Not life. Our sin results in death, not life. But Jesus, he came to die in our place to give us life. That's how much he loved us. 1 John 3.16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. Do you ever ever wonder, God, do you really love me? Do you ever think that? God, do you love me? But I say he does. He does because he has proven his love by sending his son to make you free, to die for you. And, and, and sometimes, though, when we're going through difficulties, we're going through life, we kind of think that, God, do you love me? Because I'm going through this, this stuff in my life, and it's hard. And, and, and you, may, you, you may have done something, and you think, this is the worst thing I could ever do, and that God's never going to love me again. But the truth is, he's always loved you. He's always loved you. And he's proved his love for you on the cross. See? In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, God demonstrates his love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He demonstrated his love by going to the cross. Verse 10 continues, it says, This is is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. John declares there he loved us. He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That that the Bible, again, proclaims that the wages of sin is death. That, That was the penalty of sin. It's death entered the world. Death is, is, is even separation from God. God's judgment against sin. 
And that word propitiation, we can translate that even satisfaction. Jesus satisfied the justice of God by being perfected, the perfect sacrifice for man's sin. So John defines love for us, and, and John proceeds to explain if, if we know the, this love of God, it, 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 we know God, God is love, it's gonna, it, the, the, our lives are going to be marked by love, our lives. And so our text gives us, gives us a few reasons, uh, our lives, how they should be marked with this love. And, and, and the first one's in verse 11 here. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought, also ought to love one another. I love this. Beloved, if God loves us, we also ought to love one another. Or, I like that it says, if, (laughs) if, or since God loved us, we got to love one another. We ought to. We ought to, right? The word ought speaks of uh, kind of a moral obligation. We ought to do this. You know, we have a moral obligation to love. Because we've been shown so much love, we, we ought to, we should be doing, we should be loving. You know, I've said this before, as, as Christians, we should be the most loving people on planet Earth. We should. Because we've been shown so much love in our lives, we should be the ones who are displaying this, this love of God in our lives and because the, the love he's shown us and because we're commanded to. We're commanded to do this. It's our moral obligation because Jesus said, a new commandment I give you to love one another. It's a love that's giving its best. It's, it's, it's love that's unconditional. It's a love that serves and forgives and, 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 and uh, awesome. Now, catch this, okay? It's a commandment of the Lord, not I will love when I feel like it. <laughs> right? If I feel like it, then I'll love. It doesn't say that. I don't know about you, but I've, you know, on jobs in the past, I've, I've had to work with, with people that you don't always see eye to eye with. I, I you know, worked with this one guy, and he's pretty, he was pretty, pretty egotistical, prideful. And the, the guys, this can happen even in ministry, you know? And, you know, it's like, People who are not even, like, do you even know what the word humble <laughs> means or something, you know? And, and so, or, and, and I remember the Lord speaking to me because I, I was kind of getting a hard heart towards this one particular guy that, that I worked with. And I remember the Lord said to me, you know, I just, I, I honestly, I want you to love him. I want you to love him. And, and I want you to be an example of love to him. Because, because, and I, I felt the Lord telling me in the past, you know, your hate towards him isn't any better, right? Your hate towards him isn't any, any better. Guys, isn't it a lot easier to hate and complain? It's a lot easier to justify that. People who think, well, I'll love when I feel like it, you know, kind of have it backwards, I'll obey when, when, when I feel like obeying. We don't always feel like it, though, do we? We just need to obey. I mean, the Bible tells us as husbands, husbands, love your wives, right? Well, you don't, you know, I don't feel like loving her. Or she's mean, or she's difficult, or whatever it is. But no, Jesus tells us to love our wives, You know what? I remember telling one of my coworkers, my coworkers, that that a guy who had a, you know, I, I remember telling him, hey, "Hey, I want to ask for your forgiveness because I haven't been loving you like I should, and and I haven't been serving you like I should." And you know what? Here, here's the hard part. 
is that person may still possess those qualities. It doesn't mean that everything's going to turn around, right? But it's like, I was free, you know? And I had to show him Jesus in that. I, w- I was doing what I'm responsible for. And, and now, I, I, I just could pray for him, you know, that the Lord will, will work in his life. Well, this next section here, I want you to, John continues in verse 12. I want you to just be looking for the word abide here. In verse 12, it says, Now, no no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen this and testify that the Father has sent the Son as a Savior to, of the world. Whoever confesses Jesus is the Son of God, abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. So I think five times here, John uses the word abide in these these four verses. Abide, or we could translate that continue with, or it speaks of walking with God. It speaks of living in fellowship with God. You know, when I understand God's love for me, I'm, of course, I'm drawn to him. I have a desire to be with him. I have a desire to walk with him, to be like him, to abide in him, as, as John puts it. And as I abide, John says, the, 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 you're going to have fruit in, in, in your life. You're going to have this fruit of love. You're going to have this agape, God type of love in your life. It's what Jesus taught in, in John 15. You know, to, to remain in me and I'll remain in you. you can, apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. You know, it's a, it's a natural byproduct of being planted in God. There's a popular Bible commentator. His name was G. Campbell Morgan. And G. Campbell Morgan had five sons, and they were all preachers. <laughs> they all became preachers. And someone asked G. Campbell Morgan one day, who was your favorite preacher? And without hesitation, you know what his answer was? Their mother. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Morgan. <laughs> And she had never preached a sermon in a church before. (laughs) But her life was just this constant sermon. You know, this constant illustration of the love of God. And incredible, in verse 12, it says, the love of God has been perfected or completed in us. Think about God's love, how it's completed and it's perfected to perfectly, you know, seen in us. It's not in the angels, but it's, it's in us, sinners saved by grace. It's perfected in us. And then the more I, I, I know the Lord, the closer I am to him, the more I'm going to be affected by his love. And so our lives are to be marked by love. And, it, and, and it's given to us by the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 13. And by this we know that if we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us the, his spirit. He's given us the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul told us that the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in us, it teaches us, it mot- he motivates us, he, he moves us to love. You know, in Galatians 5, it says, If I walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, and then he lists all the other attributes. And the result is if I walk in the Spirit, if I'm walking with God, I'm going to have love in my life. In life that's a natural result, right? And I'm going to see people, not the way I see people, but the way Jesus sees people, right? And I'm going to have his heart. Now, as I've been thinking about this all week, I found myself saying, well, Lord, I need to grow in my love towards others. Hopefully you're saying that. Don't don't you kind of think that? That we have some growth to do? And, and, 
you know, sometimes our love, we can get critical, can't we? We can get into the flesh. I can find myself reacting, being defensive. And as believers, we sometimes judge, sometimes we criticize, sometimes we lack sensitivity, sometimes as believers we lack compassion. But sometimes simply we just, you know, if we just got into the other person's shoes and, and realized that, you know, the things they're going through, right, and, and what they're feeling, and, and, and so we kind of have this dilemma. You know, it's this, this need to be more loving, <laughs> Right? And, and yet, we, we have to kind of struggle that, with that the rest of our lives. Well, I want to leave us with some practical advice how we can truly live this out, right? And I think I'm drawn to just Paul's life, and, and there's something very practical I think we can learn as Paul was about growing in love. You know, you think about Paul's ministry, and in his ministry, remember, he would travel from city to city, and he would preach the gospel, but one thing you, you, you read about, almost everywhere he went, he was followed. You know, the, these Jews, they, they, had, they purposed to, to, you know, to lie about him. You know, we read this in the book of Acts, that they would, they would try to turn the cities against him. And they sought to hinder him and to hinder his work. And, and, and oftentimes, he was beaten, he was stoned, he was put in prison just for sharing the gospel, right, from city to city. And, and they, they're, they're this group that they were so, they so much hated Paul and they were so serious at being an enemy, enemy of his, they took an oath. And in Acts 23, 12, it says this, and when it was day, some of the Jews band together and bound themselves under oath, saying that we should neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. I mean, think about how crazy that is. And yet Paul says something in Romans chapter 9, and he said this, I wish myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, for my countrymen according to the flesh. What Paul was saying is pretty radical. He said, I, I would go to hell, essentially, if it meant my Jewish brothers were saved. If it meant my countrymen knew the Lord, you know? And here's this group that they so hated him, and they, and they made his life horrible. And yet, his heart of love was, if, if, if I was accursed, I would do it for them. You know, the, you know, I think about who, the people who are the most difficult people in our lives. And, it, you, and you have to deal with them in your, you know, in your job or your work or your neighborhood or whatever it is. Your family. You know, they're dealing with people. And it's like, would you go to hell for that person? If it meant that person were saved? That's, that's, that's Paul's heart. And I think we have to ask this question. How did Paul come to that place? How did he get to that place where he, 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 you know, how he loved them that much? How could he develop that love when, when these people, you know, it's like, forget them. How do, how do you overcome the bitterness and disappointment and anger and hostility and, and, and you know, people who wanted it to hurt him, to kill him? Well, I think what Paul told us, he said this in Romans chapter 10. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God, to God for Israel, is that they may be saved. That was his heart. He wanted them saved. And that was his prayer. And I think that, in, in, you know, in the Greek, it, it's, it's, this is my continued prayer, is what Paul was saying. And I think that was the key, is that he was praying for them. You know, that, that he was praying for them, that he was praying for the Jews, that, that you know, that he, he, it, as he prayed for them, it produced this love in, in his own heart. Right? Isn't Jesus, didn't he tell us the same thing? 
Remember what Jesus said? Pray for your enemies. That's the key. When we bring people before the Lord, God does starts doing a work in our heart. So, Lord, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you, Father, for this call to love. Lord, we pray for those who need you. Lord, we pray for those who hurt us, those who are, make our lives difficult. Lord, we lift them to you, and, and ultimately we do. We want them to come to know you. We want them to come experience you, Lord, so they, they can experience what we've experienced. And, and so we pray, Lord, for, for you to, to, to be with them, to, uh, to, to help them, Lord. We, we pray that we would have a heart like Paul. We would have a heart like yours, Lord, to pray for our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us. Lord, when we bring people before your throne, oftentimes they don't even know we're praying for them. (laughs) But Lord, you do a work in our hearts. And as we continue to to walk with you and obey you and, and, and live for you, Lord, that's how you give us this heart of love, this agape love. And so I pray, Lord, that you would take these words, that you would take these things that we've spoke of today, and that you would be working in each of our hearts, Lord, that you would be drawing us closer and closer to you, that we too would possess and desire this agape love. So we thank you so much for this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.